All right, and we should be recording now. Yep, we are. Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, Volker and Rod are not here today, so I'll be your host for this meeting on June 22nd for the IPLD team. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we have our normal HackMD pad and uh, I will try to take notes even though I am not really good at that. Uh, cool, so I'll start with my update. Uh, it's actually pretty short. Uh, most of last week was taken figuring out how to run a Filecoin node and uh, further descent into storage deals and uh, other unsavory stuff. Um, hopefully we will actually have uh, a deal by tomorrow. Uh, I'm waiting for uh, the team which uh, works on the <clears throat> retrieval market stuff to uh, put things on the test testnet network. And then we will see if we can indeed send selectors over the wire and get parts back as Hannah says it's supposed to work. Uh, but nobody has tried this yet. It's all like the types are there, the code supposedly is there, but nobody ever ran this. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, and uh, other than that, I got a little bit closer on uh, the dagger streamer uh, from the file system. It is almost doing what I wanted to do, but it's like still not not exactly there. It, 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 it's too much too much memory trying to do things over and over again. Um, another another thing, by the way, uh, I uh, had a moment to try the new um, uh, the new ARM based uh, AWS instances that they released uh, for general availability on the 11th, I believe, and they can actually rival on AMD R9 when it comes to processing stuff in a stream. So I am able to get on this ARM instances that are like 40, 40 bucks a month. I'm able to get about a gigabyte and a half per second throughput with actual hashing and everything. So that's an interesting thing to consider maybe for something like Dumbo Drop further down the, further down the line instead of Lambdas to actually have, you know, stuff on, on diamond boxes. Um, and that's pretty much all I have for this week. Next I have Eric with a lot of notes. Well, I have no short term memory when I speak. So I have to like pre write the entire thing or I just make a lot of sounds. <clears throat> um, yeah. So, <laughs> so this last week, uh, I tried to implement an advanced data layout because we had had some discussions lately and it sounded like there was some worries that we just don't have enough proof that we know what we're doing with these and that our plans are actually well formed. So I tried to just do the thing and see if I had trouble. Um, and so I initially I was going to try to bite off doing hamps, but I thought, eh, that's a bunch of things. Um, and so instead I just sketched out the simplest thing possible to make a dummy example advanced data layout. So I invented the concept of a fan out map and started implementing that. And all this is, is for every value in the map, we're just going to encode it in a new block and put links to them in the map internals. And then that's it. So uh, this is like probably a totally useless data structure. You would be very unlikely to use this, but it should be a proof of the interface is working correctly. And so far, um, no major roadblocks. The strategy of just conform to the node interface seems to be working, at least in this Go code. Um, the biggest problem I'm probably having is that it turns out the amount of boilerplate I'm needing in writing some of this stuff, writing another node implementation, uh, is turning out rather high. And that's starting to get to me because it's not a blocker, but very irritating in the code gen work as well. So seeing it crop up in another example is making me, I'll talk more about that later. Um, 
the other thing that's interesting about trying to do an ADL interface uh, has been that there's just a lot of things that go into setting one of them up. So, like you need all of these pointers. You need a pointer to the link loader function to make your readable thing. Um, you might have a bunch of configuration stuff for it that would be specific to the ADL. Um, uh, one thing that I was tempted to put in there, but I'm probably going to rip back out, is you might need a pointer to the um, node prototype for the internal structure node that you're going to use. Um, and I think I'm going to rip that one back out because that's just the kind of configurability that, that I think you shouldn't need. Like, ADL internals should be allowed to be opinionated about the memory structure they're using at runtime. Um, so yeah, the first draft is, is finding out all sorts of things like this where like, yeah, you could make this configurable, but like, what if we didn't? Um, <laughs> so a little bit more work on that will probably be forthcoming and I wanna generate some design decision documentation around this. Um, the good news is that all of the major interfaces seem to just be working. Um, this node prototype concept that got introduced, also sometimes referred to as node style, um, does also seem to be really helping here because that gives me a place to put all of these configuration things for the ADO in one place in memory. And so then you get to use the normal node builder to actually fill in the content. And none of those function signatures need to be different because all of the fiddly bits for the ADL, any internal configuration for it happens in the prototype where it just comes along. So that is a huge relief and working really well. Uh, yeah. Um, I probably won't talk too much about my boilerplate problems, but long story short, I have to add a lot of darn boilerplate methods to every new node implementation I make. Like, if I'm making this new ADO, it's going to act like a map. I have to add all of these methods to match the interface. Like, can I be coerced to a string? And the answer is no. And Go is not being helpful for me in trying to make this concise. Uh, embeds do not quite give me the ability to do what I want, or at least they don't give me the ability to um, have error messages that include the type information in them because when you have an embed, it only sees itself. It has no way to reference the thing that it's embedded in, so it just literally cannot do this. Um, and in so many other languages, this would be easy. It's like the extends keyword in almost every object-oriented language, but I just can't do it in Go. Um, I've tried increasingly fancy things like using runtime tricks to peek into the call stack info and see if I can extract relevant names from there. And I can't. That doesn't work. <laughs> Go is very consistent about the logic it's using here. It's just consistently not what I want today. Um, and this is driving me a little bit nuts because I've also dived into the assembler and like the information is there. There is an auto-generated method stub, yeah, that has exactly the relevant information I want on the interface that is embedding the other thing, but I can't see that. There's no interface for me to get this that I have found yet. If anyone on the internet is watching this and knows a cool gopher trick, please get in contact with me and solve my problem. <laughs> Meanwhile, I am sad and the boilerplate is plentiful, but everything works. It's just annoying. Thin. I'm really frustrated by Go lately. I don't know if that's coming out, but yeah. Have you considered, uh, you know, this uh, experimental implementation that they released that has generics just right against it? And after a year and a half, we'll just... <laughs> yeah, I want to get things into people's hands faster and I don't want to build on shifting sand like that. Also, I'm not sure it would help. Well, the, the boiler sure method would. thing will help, no? I haven't looked enough to say with confidence that it's irrelevant, but I would be surprised if it is relevant. Like what I want in other languages here would not be generics. It would be like traits or subclassing or like some other virtual type inheritance thing. And I, so I'd be very surprised if Golang's definition of generics is so interesting that it would actually apply to this. It's possible, I don't know. It basically sounds like the stuff that you were talking about that 
it will surface. In order for genetics to work as described in the blog posts, exactly this info that you're missing for the errors and so on and so forth needs to be transported somewhere visible. So you won't have this problem anymore, but I don't know. Okay, I guess I'm up. Um, yeah, so I did a ton of um, porting things to ESM module standard. Um, when I started doing this, I did not realize how early I was to doing this. Um, I mean, people have been using ESM for like five years across the JS ecosystem, but um, using it in a node program that still needs to be required using the nat and, and using the native node ESM stuff, like no, almost nobody's doing that, very few people. Um, so Miles who wrote it is using it in a package. Um, and there was one example of still allow, still being able to use common JS require and it requires you compiling down <laughs> a version of the package for uh, require. And so that's what we're doing uh, across all of our modules now. There is a compiled down version of all of the entry point files that uses require. And uh, I also figured out how to cross compile all the tests so that you, we run all of our tests against that require as well. So that's really nice. Um, so all of that is updated now, all the, the multi formats and I, almost all the dependencies. I think there's like one hashing function that I need to go and get. So that's like a lot of projects across our ecosystem. Um, I also updated all of our release automation to my latest release automation stuff. Um, and I have a script now to update it in the future, which is great. Um, the block API is also up to date. There's a PR now that needs review. I need rods and put on that before I merge it. Um, and then that migration is finally complete, which will be awesome. Um, and then I did lots of managery stuff all week and, um, I need everybody's OKRs for last quarter. So if you have OKRs, I think only Eric here right now has OKRs. So score your OKRs, bro. There's a PR in the roadmap repo already. You gotta score your OKRs. And, uh, and then I'm working on the OKRs for next quarter. The thing that's relevant, I think most for everybody is that I wanna cut out a documentation week. Uh, this is actually Eric's suggestion and I'm gonna run with it, but we're gonna cut out a week where everybody on the team writes docs. Um, and I talked to Terry and she's agreed to set aside time each day to do a synchronous review on all of the docs that we're building that whole week. Um, so we can get the, imp the input of somebody who knows nothing about our stack. Well, she knows a lot about our stack, but she like maintains a very good view from like the outside of this kind of stuff. So she's like great at reviewing docs. And um, yeah, yeah, that'll be awesome. So uh, keep that in mind. And uh, yeah, that's all that I have. I mean, publicly yeah i just have a comment a week probably it's not going to be enough but it's a start <laughs> I don't, if we're all doing it that week i think that we'll get all the main things like the main thing is that all of the current resources are bad so we will at least take them down or replace them with something that is less bad um, they won't be complete but they will be uh not confusing as shit which is what they are now <laughs> Yes. The documentation should not make people understand it less. Like that, that's, that's like this, I'm setting the bar low. <laughs> that's the bar. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's what we can do in the week. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the stuff that I'm hoping to do are like make sure that the high level structure is present because even the things that we do have documented, they're like, sometimes we've got these little corners of a thing that's like super well documented but it doesn't connect to the bigger picture in a sufficiently navigable way that like for anybody to find those docs, you have to read everything exhaustively. And then maybe you realize that you found the part that you wanted, but like the barrier to entry and navigation is just currently a lot. And, and, the, and the website just makes you lot. understand it less. Yeah. The website, the website is just like, like almost misinformation. Like it is not untrue, it is just like not helpful. It's designed for a very strange audience that I'm not even sure exists. <laughs> Actually, before we go further, like bashing ourselves, Chris, what is your take on our documentation? You're kind of like an, <laughs> an external consumer. 
Um, I think I'm trying to think of how I can say it. Um, I mean, I think overall the project, so, so there's a lot of good documentation that in some ways is a bit misleading because it seems like things are more thought out than they are. But I think once you kind of like peel back the layer, it feels like there's things that are still in flux. And so I think I was misled a few times where I'm like, they've got all this stuff figured out. And while you've got a lot of stuff figured out, there's some things that aren't, that are still kind of in flux or, you know, and, and I think that's, that was the hard part is kind of knowing what is solid, complete, and like good to go versus what's kind of brand new and, you know, touch this if you really need to, but maybe kind of avoid it versus here's things we just don't know yet, but we have some ideas on. So I think kind of laying it out that way. So as a consumer, you know what is safe to use uh, and what isn't would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I don't remember whose suggestion it was, if it was Rod or maybe Juan actually, but it was, um, we should really have like an entry point for each language stack, like where you're actually like gonna write code in. And then that can do a much better job of pointing you at like the things that are really solid and the things that you should really rely on and, and shuttling away some of the other bits. Um, because it really varies by language right now, like what you should be messing with and what you shouldn't, so. Yeah, I think that's true too. Like I came in um, from a JavaScript point of view and it was later I found that, well, it wouldn't take that long to realize that Go is kind of like, you know, the most mature, advanced, thing um, and actually kind of a lot of stuff step that kind of gets done there first and trickles down. But um, actually it's probably not totally true, but I think in general within IPFS that's generally how things work. Uh, in IPFS, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Actually IPLD um, Go is kind of not as far well, as JavaScript, like transitional. So, yeah. Well, so like the, the new one is like not quite done but definitely ahead. And then the old one is like older than all of the JavaScript stuff. But then the JavaScript stuff has like a bunch of things that are still relied upon in IPFS that are the old thing. So, yeah. <sighs> yeah. yeah. It might be actually good to say uh, if you are, yeah, I don't know how to deal with the different language thing because it's gonna be differences between them in terms of maturity and readiness and whatever. But I do know one thing, mm -hmm. I think like for people that are just trying to get their head wrapped around it, maybe a, maybe a pointer that says uh, like, what, you know, I'm trying to think like, use this language and you can do this with it successfully uh, because, you know, they, they may use Rust or something and, you know, then get stuck because it's kind of like so much in flux, right? So I think having a place where you know you can go and something you can count on would be good. I don't know. I yeah, I think some of the, the loop P2P project has engaged with this a lot too, because they definitely had similar problems where like, as that project exists in originally two languages really heavily and now like, I don't know how many, they've got many different languages coming on now. Um, <clears throat> they've definitely had the same thing where it's like, oh yeah, the DHT module or something works great in this language and like, very experimental in this other language and it just doesn't exist in these four new languages yet. And um, they had a whole page of the website that I remember you could scroll down pretty long and it would have like lots of lists of maturity level scores. Um, I think I remember people from that project saying that they had some beefs with the way that they engaged that too. So I don't know, maybe we should just ask them what their final feelings are. I yeah, thought, well, like, I think it's because there's like a gatekeeper on like when you decide something is mature and so and they have a bunch of stuff that's being built by a lot of like other grants from Ethereum. Um, so like where do you rank the relative maturity of the Rust stack uh, compared to the JS stack when the same people just aren't working on either one so how do they compare to each other? Yeah. Um, because the Rust stack like the, a lot of work has gone into that Rust implementation like like but who is to say what the relative maturity is? Nobody knows both code bases well enough. You know what you need is, what do they have that in a JavaScript world, that, like to-do app, which you implement on different languages and frameworks, sorry, thank you, Mike. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, and then you could actually see um, maybe something like that could kind of help us. It's a new app for IPLV. I don't know. I think like I was just thinking about this. Um, one thing that I did in the new JS multi-formats library that you can go check out is that because you, you have to go and implement all these plugins for hashing functions and codecs, I started to actually put in tables for all the known ones. Um, and that actually looks really nice. And so I think in the new website and the new docs, we can do that in each language and they'll all be fairly comparable, right? So like for the multi-format stuff, like here's all the hashing functions and then like, oh, you can see that like maybe one language doesn't have as many as the other one. Um, and then when we get into IPLD, you could even do it for some of the advanced data structures, right? So like, here's our HAMP, like here are the implementations in these different languages. Like, oh, you see like that language doesn't have it, it's probably a bit behind. Um, or, you know, here's like schema validation libraries and stuff like that, like in, in each one. Cool. All right, good stuff. Um, all right, I'm all done. Any, anybody else? Um, I guess, I, uh, Chris, I'm going to put you on the spot again a little bit. Uh, <laughs> this uh, conversation that we had with Michael about um, the maturity of the uh, flexible byte format, uh, is this something that like helps with the way this right now, or there are things that are basically missing from your point of view? Or you haven't had a chance to read that yet? I, I haven't had a chance. I, I was kind of waiting for it to, the dust to settle, um, but I am like so close to actually starting on my Rust implementation of what I'm doing. And that's something I'm going to need to look at right away. So I have a busy day tomorrow, but Wednesday I have time again. Uh, so I'll probably poke around and see what I can do. My requirements may not be, um, you know, the, the way I have seen the most recently updated may not be ideal for what I want. Um, so I, I don't know if, uh, and just maybe different set of requirements, but I'm definitely gonna give a look. So I can report back on Monday or on the IPLD channel either way. Awesome. Yeah, yeah oh just, man, this is, a, this is a rough two weeks to get into the Rust deck because Polker's out this whole two weeks. So. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, yeah, yeah. I, I see that, but I'm optimistic I'm able to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll see how it goes. I think I like speed Rust pretty darn well, um, and I may actually he asked for kind of a code review on the multi-format stuff, so I may just start by digging into the code and looking at it to get a feel for what uh, I, what aspects of Rust they're using and you know how things are laid out. So we'll see. The JavaScript implementation is not very big; like it's a pretty easy data structure to implement. Um, I will say though that like there isn't a schema validation library in Rust yet, so that might be just something that you just need to be careful and like get get a lot of good review to make sure that you're not breaking the schema anywhere because I don't think that there's anything that's going to check that for you right now. Or you could just check, you could just um use the actually yeah if you just like dump a bunch of the blocks into a car file then you could load them up and and do the testing in JavaScript and then it would be fine. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, car files actually work across ac across stacks now. It's, it's it's kind of awesome. Yeah. Um. So I uh one one more thing from my side. Uh, kind of on the heels of what I just asked, Chris. <coughs> Sorry. Um. I raised this issue about um, what are ints in schemas. And we're kind of saying like, well, it's just a number. Uh, how does this actually gel together with the flexible byte layout, which has a size where it's super important how wide this size is? So, sorry, say that again. I, I missed the first part of that somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so, so. Uh, so in schemas, we kind of say, when we say int, we don't really say what kind of int it is. But in flexible byte layout, we really have to say what kind of int the size is. So how do we reconcile that? Well, I mean, if it were ever a negative number, it would just flat out not work. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, the failure I mean, case is there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the width of it starts towards six four bits. That part. Mm, mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh man, numbers. Eric's favorite topic. Um, yeah. <laughs> 
like a bit, basically, uh, a bit, we, we can discuss this last time. And we said like, yeah, it's kind of implementation specific. Uh, and my question is now, yeah. if it is implementation specific, how do we treat the flexible byte layout then? So if you look at the data model spec, data model spec says that your data, in order to be compliant, you have to support 64 bit integers. Um, like you, you are, sorry, you have to support big integers. Um, like it says that in the spec without losing precision. So that means that for instance, like JSON doesn't actually have a problem with large integers. Um, JavaScript has a problem with large integers. So we can't use like the regular JavaScript parser. We have to use one that will recognize that they can use big integers um, for that reason. Or I think just use a newer, I think that the latest VMs have JSON implementations that will detect it and use a big number. Um, so that works now. But um, anyway, yeah, so it's sort of the job of the codec implementation to make sure that when it gets a large number that it puts it into the proper large number format for that language. Okay, so basically as far as, sch as schema is concerned, our integers are essentially uh, arbitrary precision. Yep. yep. Okay, that, that, that's the part I was missing because we actually don't say this anywhere mm -hmm. in the data models. Yes. Right. Yeah, I think I think, I think the, we do mer the merge docs are insufficient on this. Um, we I think our agreement is basically that yes, we're going to treat things as roughly infinite precision. Um, we've struggled with how exactly to phrase that. Maybe we should just say it. <coughs> um, some of the clarifications that I use to make this not keep me up at night is uh, we don't do math in IPLD. And thank God, because that means <laughs> that we get to care about this a hell of a lot less and we can safely punt it to. That's implementation specific much more reliably because all of the things that we're punting to be implementation specific are it works or it should error real hard. <clears throat> there are no undefined transitions where like math occurs and it does <clears throat> something weird or something else. It's do something or halt. And so I assume that that would continue to just apply in the internal of the flexible byte layout spec. If you start processing some of this stuff with a library that doesn't support big enough integers for the data that you're processing, then it should halt. Right, so mm -hmm. basically we, we almost need to define uh, hold on known out of bounds values kind of thing. That I is a requirement we, for libraries. I think we should just as well write that up. Yeah, because I can't imagine what else we would do. And it's better to say it rather than imply yeah. it. No, that's that's actually great. That's no. that's what I would do as well. I just wasn't sure that is sufficient. Yeah. Mike? Well, I can't think of a case in which we do that. So, because we, we, so we have two, we basically have two co types of codecs, right? We have IPLD native codecs and then we have codecs for things that already exist that we're just parsing um, and turning into data model. For the things we're parsing and turning into data model, there's like a known, num like the spec that we write is effectively like, we're taking this value and then we're representing it in our data model. And our, and our data model says it's arbitrary. Um, and so each of those languages would have to support whatever precision is in each of those specs. And if it can't support it, then it would have to cause an exception. For our specs, we do say you have to support arbitrarily low integers. For our codec specs, we say you, you need to support arbitrarily large like numbers, basically. Um, and without losing precision. I mean, we should say that if we, if we don't. Well, Okay, I don't know if I agree with that because literally none of our codecs will, not a single one of them. Well, so what? It wouldn't be productive. Support definition. arbitrary precision? Yeah. No, no, I mean, JSON, the, the DAG JSON codec would have a problem with that if we didn't go out of our way to solve it. I mean, the Go one certainly doesn't. Never has in any version. Support large numbers? No. Well, are you sure? Or, no, 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 wait, 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 like, 
Go just like JavaScript does not support them out of the box. You have to do something like you have to use the begin. Yeah, right? and there, there's no universally community agreed upon definition of begin. Like there is not a begin in the standard library that I know of. So well, there definitely is. Oh, okay. Well, that I know of is an important qualifier there. I, I might be wrong now because I need to see what what they wrote, uh, like what the base fifty eight. Uh, Stuff is written against. Uh, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> I, maybe there's something in the X series of packages. I don't, I don't actually know. Um, but I can definitely tell you that none of our codecs in any of our things support that right now. Yeah, I mean, like, because what ends up happening is that this turns into a determinism problem um, on read write. Right, because you read data, you don't have a, you, you parse it into something that doesn't have sufficient capacity for the integer precision. And then you re-serialize it and you're, you're not actually re-serializing the right data because you now mutated the integer when you didn't want to. Except if you use the definition of when you overflow, you halt, then you do not have that problem, which is why that's very- Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, if you, if you want to throw, that's fine. Like if your language just doesn't support it, your language doesn't support it. Like, um, I think that though, if you're going to write the code to halt, you might as well just write the code to put it into a big integer. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I just pasted it in the chat. Uh, Go definitely has a core mass begin. I don't know from which version, but uh, from 11 onwards for sure. All right, that's cool. So, yeah. Um, okay, so if we assume that every language that we tar that, that we want to target has some type of big end library, then the rest becomes a non problem, or there are still edge cases. So it's it's on the list of things that we need to worry about every time that we deal with a codec. So every time that we're like taking an existing format and figuring out how to represent it, like whenever we're doing that work, we, we need to like we, somewhere we need to start writing down like all the things that you need to go and worry about. Like you need to worry about map sorting and you need to worry about like this and this and that. Like that. This is like one of the things you need to worry about. Yeah, um, yeah I, I basically, like I understand it's a, it's, it's a huge mm -hmm. issue. I specifically want to scope it to FBL, like inflexible byte layout. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically so, say, so FBL, yeah. FBL's fine. Like FBL shouldn't have to say anything particular about it. Like. I, I, like it is on top of a stack that says like we are handling this for you or growing, <laughs> and um, and okay. and yeah, all those all those concerns just like you know belong there. Um, I think and the only thing that we may need to think about is like if if we want to introduce a feature into schemas that allowed you to in your schema say add some specificity to your numbers like. For instance, this has to be a negative number, or you know, something like that. Then, um, then, or, or you know, this can't be a negative number. If we wanted to add something like that, that would that would still be a schema feature, though, and not a codec feature or an FBL feature. It would be like a schema feature first, and then maybe we use it in that FBL. Um, but you know, that's a different conversation about like schema features. Yeah. No. This this makes sense. Cool. That mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This answers all of it. All right, that's all I have. Cool. All right. Cool, cool, cool. Cool. Well, then, um, bye, everybody, and uh, see you next week. Awesome. Let me stop recording.